This meeting is now being recorded. And the, the second disclaimer that I have is that um, mention of trade names or commercial products does not constitute endorsement or recommendation for use. <clears throat> the purpose of this webinar is to give you an update on our cook stove testing project. Some of you have expressed your interest in our test data, including raw data, as well as test results. So we are presenting a spreadsheet format for sharing data for your review and comments. We want to discuss test methods, especially for batch-fueled stoves, because we have found these stoves are challenging to test. After the, the webinar today, as Rainey mentioned, we will post the recorded session, the presentation slides with notes, and the spreadsheet for your further comments. The first part of this webinar will be on stove testing issues that may be of more broad interest to many of you. And the second part will focus on the spreadsheet that may be of more narrow interest to some of you. Here is some very brief background information. We conducted two previous rounds of testing, and results were published in scientific journal articles in 2009 and 2012. Links are provided for your information. If you are interested in more details on other EPA stove research activities, please see the link to the presentation from the recent Clean Cooking Forum. We are currently in the middle of a third round of laboratory testing that is coordinated with field testing sponsored by EPA's Office of Air and Radiation and led by John Mitchell. John, will you give us an update? And Thank John, you, Jim. May... Yeah. It was just a little uh, gap before we could talk. Um, so we, as Jim had explained, had two rounds of stove testing, and we opened. A, we wanted to have a third round of stove testing. So we opened a process inviting uh, those organizations who wanted to have their stoves tested at the EPA lab to submit a um, sort of a response. And what we were looking for is stoves that are uh, actually in use, not um, stoves that are in development, um, that are sold in some numbers in the field and stoves that were different from the ones we've already tested so that we could um, increase our body of knowledge of the different stoves throughout the world. Um, so one of the things we're also doing is we're also linking the stoves we're testing uh, in the lab with some stoves we're testing in the field. Uh, we have a limited um, amount of money to do uh, rounds of stove testing uh, in the field, both the kitchen performance test, um, and also emissions testing with Berkeley Air Monitoring. Um, in prior years, uh, they did this testing in uh, Nepal, in India, and in Peru. And in this round, they're uh, doing the testing in Uganda and just finished up in Benin and in India. The idea is, with the stove testing in the field, is try to learn more about how stoves work in the field but also what correlation there is, if any, to the same stove being tested at the lab, uh, Jim's lab in North Carolina. Again, those uh, stove programs were selected through an application process where we invited people to um, let us know of their uh, desire to have their stoves tested. Uh, we also are working uh, at EPA to build capacity on stove knowledge. We're trying to work with uh, those organizations that are building and disseminating stoves to help them make those stoves as uh, good as they can be. Um, we have held a number of workshops around the world, and these are basically all teach, all learn workshops. We do have experts coming in, showing people how to test their stoves, talking about performance and design, but we also have all the participants share their knowledge. And again, the idea is to try to get every stove made around the world as good as it can be and have all our partners committed to continuous improvement. Um, EPA um, is a partner of the Alliance, and um, we should know that this research is funded independently by EPA in support of the Alliance's goals and mission. I also want to note that EPA is participating um, in the ISO Technical Committee 285 um, with the uh, Global Alliance, 
and we look forward to working with many of you um, who are on this webinar um, to ensure that that um, ISO process is uh, open and transparent and we get the best results we can and we really move our community forward uh, to ensure that, again, um, the stoves, uh, we know how they work in the lab and ideally more and more we know how they work in the field and that we develop uh, excellent standards that will really move our community um, forward. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, John. The purpose of our cook stove testing is to provide an independent source of data to partners of the Alliance. We hope our test results, data, and experience will be useful for developing testing protocols and standards. We support the development of the regional testing and knowledge centers, and some of those centers are sponsored by the Alliance. In support of the regional testing and knowledge centers, we conducted a week-long intensive training workshop at our laboratory in North Carolina this year. The workshop was sponsored and co-hosted by the Alliance. We had 42 great participants from 16 different countries. They were scientists, engineers, and stove testers from many of the regional centers. Faculty included folks from EPA, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group, Colorado State University, Aprovecho Research Center, University of Illinois, Food and Fuel Consultants, and the CTAR Center. There were classroom sessions and laboratory activities in the EPA cook stove testing facility. The Alliance will sponsor a series of cook stove testing workshops at rotating locations. EPA was honored to host the first workshop to support the development of the network of centers. For more information, please see the links for training materials and for a communique that was issued by the participants. Our work with the regional testing centers focuses on sharing knowledge and good practices, regardless of the testing protocol that is used. As John discussed, we will participate in the ISO process to develop standards and test protocols for stoves. At first, the ISO process seemed a bit complicated to me, but now I understand that the real technical work of developing and drafting standards and protocols will be done by working groups that will be inclusive of experts from many countries. Standards and protocols will be based on consensus and best practices. The timeline is likely to be three years, beginning sometime after the first ISO meeting in November. We are testing stoves now, and we cannot wait for three years for a final standard. So in the interim, we are using the guidelines from the ISO IWA and the water boiling test protocol. Links are provided here. There are different water boiling test protocols, but when we refer to the water boiling test or the WBT in this webinar, we are referring to the version specified here. Other testing protocols are used by some labs. Many of us stove testers share a burning desire to do good work, but we don't always agree with each other on the best approaches. Sometimes we disagree, but when we take time to carefully consider each other's viewpoints and data, we learn from each other and we advance the science and art of stove testing. I've heard from some people who feel that stove testing is changing too quickly and it's difficult to keep up with all the changes, but then I've heard from others who feel frustrated that things are not changing fast enough. The ISO process will take time, but I think it gives us the best opportunity we've ever had to advance stove testing. Various existing test protocols have different purposes or combinations of purposes. Protocols have different advantages and disadvantages, such as those listed here. And these are some of the factors that may be considered in the ISO process. Despite the differences between protocols, there are many similarities. 
and I believe there is a good opportunity for developing a unified ISO standard based on consensus protocols. There are ongoing developments. Existing protocols are being modified and improved, and new protocols are being developed. On protocol developments, <coughs> the most recent water bowling test version is posted, and the spreadsheet continues to be developed with input from users. Experimental guidelines for testing charcoal stoves were recently developed by an ad hoc working group formed at this year's Clean Cooking Forum. A plancha stove testing protocol is under development by a group of stakeholders. A solar cooker testing standard is under revision. A stove durability protocol is being developed. Field testing protocol discussion groups have been established. More information is available from the links. All of these efforts and many more developments may feed into the ISO process. Lastly, there is a need for a testing protocol for batch-fueled stoves. This need was expressed in a resolution in the IWA, and this need is one of the reasons we are holding this webinar. This photo shows stoves we are currently testing. Stoves listed in bold text are batch fueled with wood. The stove shown inside the red circle is the one we will focus on in this webinar. It is a batch fueled pyrolytic T LUD or top lip <coughs> updraft <coughs> excuse me type cook stove. <coughs> Thanks to Karsten Bechtel and Creek in Uganda for permission to use preliminary results for the Muoto stove for discussion purposes today and for review of the spreadsheet. <clears throat> Along with testing cook stoves, we are also evaluating three types of solar cookers, and Seth is working on a publication that will include results. In the laboratory, we are measuring fuel consumption, energy efficiency, power, in emissions of air pollutants listed here. The IWA guidelines specify that measurements of only carbon monoxide and particulate matter are required for rating stoves for emissions, but we are measuring emissions of additional pollutants that may affect human health and the environment. We are measuring gaseous and particulate pollutants in real time as well as in some integrated measurements. The water boiling test protocol has three test phases that include two power levels. There is a high power cold start, a high power hot start, and a low power simmer. We test most biomass fueled stoves with two fuel moisture levels, and we perform at least three replications as specified in the WBT. The total number of test phases then is at least 18 and this requires at least 18 filters for gravimetric analysis of particulate matter. Gravimetric analysis is specified in the IWA because it is the most reliable way to measure emissions of PM mass. Analyzing a separate filter for each test, for each test phase, provides useful data during different operating conditions. Filters must be carefully weighed before and after testing, and it is a time-consuming process. For each test phase, we also use two quartz fiber filters for determining organic carbon and elemental carbon in particulate matter, so we analyze at least 36 quartz filters for each stove fuel combination. This OCEC analysis is also a time-consuming process. We have heard many good suggestions for how we could expand stove testing in the future, and a few of the suggestions are listed here. We could test at more cooking power levels. We usually test at two power levels 
as specified in the WBT, but we've published results that show the value of testing at more than two levels. An example of another stove testing protocol that uses multiple power levels is the standard test for EPA certified heating stoves in the United States. And it requires four power levels. We've heard suggestions for three or four power levels for testing cook stoves. Other suggestions are that we could test with more than one pot, we could test with different types, species, sizes, or shapes of fuel. We could test with more replications to improve the ability to determine statistically significant differences between test results. The number of replications needed depends on specifics of the test. But more than one research group has suggested that we generally need more replications than three. And the numbers suggested for testing typical biomass-fueled stoves have been 7, 10, or as many as 20. Other researchers have suggested that we could test using a burn cycle or drive cycle approach that would enable the lab test conditions to be more reflective of actual field conditions, and that could improve the correlation between lab and field test results. I think all of these suggestions and some others are good ideas, and I think many of these ideas may be incorporated in a unified stove testing protocol or protocols developed through the ISO process. I think a challenge for us will be to come to a consensus on how we can integrate the best ideas in the test protocol that will be practical for testing centers to use on a routine basis. I think the example outlined in this slide illustrates the challenge. If we tested with just one more cooking power level, with two different pots, with two types of fuel, and with seven replications, we would have a total number of test phases that would be impractical for a routine test. But we have a smart, creative, and diverse group of scientists, engineers, and stove testers from many countries who will be working on this challenge through the ISO process. And I think we can and will come to a consensus on practical, unified standards and protocols. There will be many more considerations for developing standards and protocols, but here are some that I think are important. I think it is a very good idea to test at least three cooking power levels. I think it is essential to meet statistical requirements, but I think we need to minimize the number of test replications, and I think we can do that by carefully controlling the test conditions, especially the fuel burning rate at each power level tested. This is easy for some stoves, such as LPG stoves, but it is a challenge for other stoves that are more difficult to control. We can specify metrics that tend to have less variation. For example, we can specify cooking power in units of watts rather than using the familiar time to boil that typically has a larger variation than cooking power. We can use statistical analysis to minimize the number of test replications needed. I think we can use data from the field to determine which parameters are most important to inform lab testing conditions and to determine when to test different pots, fuels, and fuel moisture levels. I think we can develop lab tests that better reflect field performance, but I think we must recognize that lab tests cannot substitute for field tests. When we, when we test stoves in the laboratory, we have more control over variables and less variation in results compared to testing done in the field. But lab tests have very limited ability to predict how stoves are actually used in the field. The lab test provides no information on the local context. But if we have information from the field, we can better simulate field performance in the lab. 
Lab tests generally cost less than field tests because field tests typically require larger sample sizes for its statistical significance. Lab tests are better for perf comparing performance under controlled conditions, while field tests are better for comparing actual performance in uncontrolled conditions. There are many examples of disagreement between lab and field test results for stoves. But when we look at those examples, we find that stoves were tested under very different conditions in the lab and field. If we test under similar conditions, we should get similar results. On the other hand, when we test stoves under more ideal conditions in the lab, that testing can also have value because if a stove does not perform well in a lab test, it is unlikely to perform any better in the field, and we can test a stove at lower cost in the lab before conducting field trials. The bottom line is that laboratory and field testing are both needed and can be complementary. I think this slide beautifully illustrates the potential for lab and field tests to be complementary. Thanks to Michael Johnson and Berkeley Air Monitoring Group for permission to use this slide. The reference at the bottom includes a link to the recent publication of these results. This slide shows percent fuel savings for three different stoves tested in three different countries, and the red bars separate the three different cases. The WBTs are the lab tests, the CCTs are the controlled cooking tests, and the KPTs are the kitchen performance tests that are done in the field. The error bars show variation in terms of plus or minus one standard deviation. Results from lab and field tests are generally similar, and the lab tests have less variation. In the Peru case, the KPT field testing provides additional valuable information. Results here show that fuel savings increased with stove maintenance and training, denoted by the M and T at the bottom of the chart. This is the kind of information that is impossible to get with lab testing. I think most of us would agree with the comment on this slide that we need better understanding of why different testing approaches agree or do not agree. I think we are more likely to see agreement between lab and field tests for stoves that use process fuels and for stoves that require less attention and manipulation by the user, but many other factors are involved. And now let's introduce our EPA spreadsheet it is based on the IWA and the WBT. It includes the raw data, calculations, and final results. The spreadsheet is specific to EPA equipment and research purposes, and it is not designed for use by other testing labs. A draft spreadsheet with data and results for the MOTO stove will be posted for your review and comments. Since the results for this stove are not finalized, please do not quote or cite the results. Included in the EPA spreadsheet are some enhancements to the WBT. Some of these enhancements might be considered in the next revision of the WBT or in other protocols that are developed. <coughs> seven enhancements to the WBT spreadsheet. First, we account for ash remaining at the end of each test phase, as recommended in Taylor's 2009 master's thesis. A link is provided. At Iowa State University, Taylor did an independent review and evaluation of the water boiling test. He described limitations of the WBT and he found that the largest potential source of error is in failing to address the ash content in the material remaining in the stove at the end of the test phase. The error is small with fuels such as wood 
with relatively small ash content, but the error can be large with fuels such as charcoal, some crop residues, and dung with relatively large ash content. The error may be minimized if the ash can be physically separated from unburned fuel and char, but this is difficult with some fuels such as rice hulls. Accounting for ash in calculations enables us to get a more accurate measurement of the mass of remaining char when we place the stove with remaining char and ash on an electronic balance at the end of the test. When possible, placing the stove on a balance is easier and faster than dumping out the remaining char and separating the ash. Taylor concluded that, quote, if the test is altered to properly account for ash, the minimum method error drops to about 5%, unquote. These are additional enhancements to the spreadsheet. Number two, we test most biomass stoves with both low and high moisture fuel. When we test a stove with high moisture fuel, low moisture fuel is usually required to start the fire, similar to the way the stove is actually used in the field. Our spreadsheet has calculations for handling fuels with two different moisture contents during the same test. Number three, we do proximate and ultimate analyses of fuel and remaining char, and we use the measured values in our calculations. Number four, we report additional metrics for emissions, fuel use, and cooking power. Number five, our spreadsheet includes calculations for air pollutant emissions specific to our equipment. Number six, we are using the total capture method for quantifying emissions, so the air velocity measurements in our dilution tunnels are critical. We correct the air velocity for moisture in the air. This correction is small when there is a large ratio of dilution error to emissions, but the correction can be significant when there is a small dilution ratio. Number seven, lastly, we are calculating metrics both with and without the energy of the remaining char included for pyrolytic or char producing stoves. And we will discuss this more in a few minutes. For those of you who are not familiar with pyrolytic stoves, here is a very brief description. Solid fuel is heated using primary air to release volatile gases that are then combusted using, using secondary air. The pyrolytic stoves we are testing are batch fueled, but there are some other types of pyrolytic stoves that are fueled continuously. Pyrolysis produces char or charcoal that is richer in carbon content than the wood or other biomass fuel that is used in the process. Char that remains after pyrolysis may be combusted in the same stove if the stove is designed to combust the char, or the char can be saved for fuel and combusted in a different stove, ideally in a stove designed for charcoal fuel, or it can be saved and used for biochar or other purposes, or finally it may just be discarded and not used for any purpose. In this webinar, we are focusing on a batch-fueled pyrolytic stove for several reasons. We previously tested a T-LUD, or uh, top-lit, updraft type stove with low moisture wood pellet fuel, and we published results that showed the stove had high energy efficiency and low emissions. We have received many comments on pyrolytic stoves. And there has been quite a debate going on between some of our colleagues over char-producing stoves. On one side of the debate are people who are developing or promoting char-producing stoves, and they are concerned that testing may not be adequately capturing the potential benefits of char-producing produce, stoves. On the other side of the debate are people who are concerned that testing may not be adequately capturing the potential losses of efficiency 
with char producing stoves. Here at EPA, here at EPA we appreciate all your comments and our job is to test stoves and report results in a way that is fair, unbiased, and useful. I'll come back to this topic of testing and reporting efficiency for char producing stoves a little later in this presentation. Now back to this slide. Batch loaded stoves are challenging to test for us because there is no widely accepted testing protocol. We want your further comments on test methods and we want to participate in developing a test protocol, possibly through an ISO working group. We know of four alternative methods for testing batch fuel pyrolytic stoves. There may be others or other variations. In method one, the fire is extinguished at the end of the test phase and the unburned fuel and remaining char are sorted and separated. We used this method in the past for testing stoves with pellet fuel, but it was tedious to separate the charred and uncharred pellets and there was uncertainty with partially charred pellets. In method two, the fire is extinguished at the end of the test phase, and the remaining char and unburned fuel are collected and ground together to obtain a representative sample that is analyzed for heat of combustion and for composition. This method, method two, is certainly more accurate than method one but it requires many fuel samples to be analyzed because the composition of the char and remaining fuel may be different in each test replication. In method three, the test pot is removed at the end of the WBT test phase and is replaced with a calibrated burnout pot. The pyrolysis process is allowed to continue to completion and the energy that is left in the fuel at the end of the test phase is estimated from the energy input to the burnout pot. A link is provided for more details. Method three has the advantage of being consistent with the WBT while allowing pyrolysis to continue to completion, so there is no remaining fuel mixed with char at the end of the procedure. We think it is a good idea to allow the pyrolysis process to complete for the entire batch of fuel because this is how stoves are typically operated in the field. We also think it is a good idea to capture emissions and measure performance over the entire burn cycle for the batch of fuel. So we are suggesting and using method four. In method four, the test phase includes the entire burn cycle and this is a modification to the WBT procedure. This is a brief description of our suggested modified WBT procedure for pyrolytic stoves. First, we experiment with the stove to determine approximately how much fuel is required to complete each WBT test phase. We think this is consistent with, with field use as stove users learn how much fuel to load to complete a cooking task. In the high power test phases, when the water reaches boiling temperature, we do not immediately stop the test, but we let the test continue until the pyrolysis process completes. We have done experiments that show that we measure the same energy input to the pot, whether the water is boiling or not, so it does not matter if the water continues to boil at the end of the test phase. During the low power test phase, we also allow the pyrolysis process to continue to completion. We analyze samples of fuel and remaining char. The fuel analysis results for remaining char at the end of pyrolysis are consistent between test replications, so fuel analysis is not required for every single test replication. Jim and Seth, uh, we have one question that's come in that's related to the four methods that you illustrated in the last slide. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a comment that uh, expresses agreement with method four being the best, but the question is about whether any of the methods have been compared to each other for accuracy. 
we have we have not done a a uh, formal comparison of the accuracy of the four test methods, and um, that it would be interesting to to do that comparison. Okay. Thank you. For, thank you for that, Rainey. And um, before um, Seth begins showing you the spreadsheet, I want to show you this schematic of our cook stove testing facility. We have two hoods for collecting emissions. One is for testing stoves with tall chimneys, and one is for stoves without chimneys. The system has two dilution tunnels, so we can measure air pollutant emissions at different concentrations depending on the instruments or methods. The primary dilution tunnel has the higher concentration, <clears throat> and Seth may refer to this in the spreadsheet as the six-inch duct. The secondary dilution tunnel has the lower concentration, and Seth may refer to this as the 10-inch duct. So next, uh, Seth will give you a brief tour of our draft spreadsheet. And I want to remind everyone again that we are not suggesting that other labs use this spreadsheet for testing stoves because this is specific to our EPA equipment and research purposes. We are making this draft spreadsheet available as a way to share our data and as a way to obtain feedback and comments on our testing. Now, Seth has spent countless hours working on this, and, um, and he knows this spreadsheet better than anyone. Seth? Thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> I just want to start by telling everybody that um, I'm going to show you a series of screen captures of what our spreadsheet looks like in the next few slides. Um, but to do that and give you as much detail as possible um, on the spreadsheet slides, since sometimes the text gets a little small, I'm not actually going to put any bullet points or text on the slides. But, like Jim just said, uh, we are going to make the presentation available after, uh, after we've finished. And on that will be all of the speaker notes so that you'll be able to see the, the notes that I made on each slide as it corresponds to each slide later at your leisure. <clears throat> so we're actually starting the tour um, backwards a little bit. So we're starting at the summary, which would be the equivalent of the final answer, and working back towards the raw data. Um, so you'll see most of the steps on our way through. On the summary tab, oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, you'll see along the bottom of the images that each uh, sheet that we're looking at is circled in red, and that's to kind of help you keep track of where we are as we move through so that we're not switching sheets without you realizing it. So right now you can see we've circled that our summary tab um, is, is the one that we're looking at right now. So starting at the top of the sheet, we have a, all of the important to define test conditions, such as a description of the stove, um, a description of the fuel, including the average moisture content and how it was prepared dimensionally, um, a description of the pot, as well as how we've loaded the pot. In this case, um, a seven liter pot was used, but we filled it with five liters of water. And finally, uh, we've included more for our records than anything else, uh, the days on which the uh, stove was tested. And these are specifically the days that are included in this summary. We may have done more tests, but we decided that the uh, data for that test shouldn't be included in this overall summary and the tier evaluations, and so the date isn't listed there. Um, and on this summary sheet, um, all of the information on here is entered automatically. Now that's done uh, to avoid typographical errors when we copy things over. That's all of the information on the top of the sheet about the stove and the test conditions as well as the values used to evaluate the tiers and the actual tier values all fill in automatically based on formulas entered in the spreadsheet. Some of them get pretty complicated. Um, 
but like we said, we will make a copy of this spreadsheet available to you so you can take a look at it and see how we're going about doing it. In the middle, we have the overall tier values on the left for each of the three broad categories that we evaluate. There's also a tier value for safety, but we don't do those tests here. Um, but then on the right, we include the individual evaluation values as well as sub-tier values so that would-be users can decide if a stove meets their individual needs based on these evaluations rather than the overall tier values. On the bottom of the sheet, um, like Jim said, we, we included the cooking power during the high power phases, that's the cold start and the hot start. We've included that as watts rather than something like time to boil. Um, we've also included the fuel burning rates for each, this is an average, for each of the three test phases, and that's to facilitate uh, replication of our results at another testing center or even um, within our own testing center in the future. So you see on the bottom now we've moved on to the next tab. So this is uh, CS results, which is the results for all of the cold start phases that were performed during the testing of this stove. Uh, so this and the next two sheets provide detailed results for the three different uh, phases of the WBT, the cold start, the hot start, and the simmer, um, for each phase individually, but for all of the tests uh, next to each other. Now we do this uh, so that we can compare key parameters um, all in one place to make it easier for us to evaluate um, the test replications to see if we're satisfied with our statistics and the uh, reproducibility of our tests. You'll see in this example, we actually performed four different uh, cold start phases, but the results from the fourth replication have been excluded from the overall summary and the, uh, the final average results. And we did that because, in the comment box on the top, it says, as an experiment, we left the, uh, the primary air control gate wide open to see how, as an experiment, that would affect the burning rate. And what it resulted in was that the fuel burning rate was too high relative to the rest of our tests and so we decided not to include that test in our overall results. Down below that, the efficiency and burning rate information, we have uh, results for individual air pollutant measurements that we make at the EPA. You can see here, THC is for total hydrocarbons, and you can see some of the carbon monoxide results for the cold start. Um, and I just want to point out that since we chose to exclude test four based on its burning rate, all of the results for test four are excluded from our averages. So we don't only exclude the burning rate, we exclude all of the emissions measurements and everything else. <clears throat> um, and the long list of air pollutants that we measure uh, that Jim presented earlier um, are available on this sheet by scrolling down uh, further on the sheet all the way until you get to the bottom, where we have um, an evaluation of the particle size distribution. Now, there's been extensive research to say that certain sizes of airborne particles are more likely to be toxic to humans than others just because of penetration into the airways and things like that. And so we include an average size distribution during the cold start phases um, that we performed. Now, this graph represents the average of the three test phases that we decided to include in the summary, and it excludes that fourth test. One scan for this instrument is near real time, lasts two and a half minutes, and all of the raw data for each one of those scans is included in the overall spreadsheet so that we can then go back later and evaluate the different parts of the burn cycle so we can see if during burnout the particles are different or during ignition the particles are different and that's just to make it easier to do all in one place. Now we skipped the other two results tabs here. Uh, you'll see we've skipped on to the results from one of the individual tests. Um, the reason that we did that was the other two result tabs are very, very similar to the cold start tab, um, and so we just don't want to belabor the, the details. Um, 
We've also skipped the general information tab, and we did that because it's very similar to the general information tab on the water boiling test spreadsheet available on the Alliance website. Um, although we have moved some of the individual inputs to these um, tabs for each of the individual test replications because we found that they do vary from day to day. So this portion of the, of the sheet should look fairly familiar to anybody f uh, that uses the water boiling test spreadsheet, but we have made some enhancements like Jim said. So on this sheet, anything that's shaded blue um, is an EPA addition or enhancement. Anything shaded gray is someplace that a user input should happen. Um, and you'll see there um, for the dry weight of multiple pots, some of the boxes are lighter gray, and that's just to indicate to whoever's using this spreadsheet that those inputs are probably not going to be required very often, but they may be required. Mm -hmm. um, the white cells are all filled automatically, either by dynamic formulas or by um, automated code that we've built into the sheet. Other enhancements include um, our fuel elemental analysis, um, moisture content, and the calorific values are all entered automatically, and that's based on our fuel batch number, which I'll talk about in a second, and the individual sample number for the fuel used in that test. We've also included um, a particulate matter filter identification block, and it includes our internal filter identification tracking numbers and specific parameters that we need for our testing facility. So um, you see we have the type of filter that helps us indicate if it's, like Jim said, uh, for the gravimetric analysis or for the organic and elemental carbon analysis. And we also see which dilution tunnel that we measured it off of. In this case, it was the secondary dilution tunnel, the 10-inch duct. Now we're on the same tab. You see it's still circled, the second test on the bottom. Um, this area of the sheet should actually look even more familiar to anybody who's, who's familiar to, uh, with the water boiling test spreadsheet on the Alliance website. Um, in this area, we've added um, accounting for the mixture of low moisture and high moisture content fuel. And we've done this automated, um, in an automated way for each test phase because the ratio of the high moisture content fuel to the low moisture content fuel may be different for each phase. And so this average fuel moisture content may actually be different for each test phase. And so we've automated that so that it happens without us having to manually calculate it. We've also um, modified the way that the remaining char is calculated and um, to account for the ash content of the fuel in the remaining char. And that's um, in line with the uh, thesis that Jim was talking about before. Um, it's especially useful for charcoal stoves um, because they're high ash content fuels or stoves that may not be emptied after every um, test phase because the ash may accumulate. And by accounting for it this way, we don't have to try to separate the remaining char from the ash. And it's also very useful for char-producing stoves because then we get a more accurate measurement of the amount of remaining char. Now, I know there's been a lot of discussion, like Jim said, about um, how to evaluate the efficiency of char-producing stoves. And so I'm going to let him take over for a second to talk about that. Hey, thanks, Seth. Okay, so so I'm, I'm going to dis discuss these uh, efficiency calculations for char-producing stoves. As I mentioned before, there has been debate on this topic, and our goal at EPA is to report efficiency in a way that is fair and clear to all stakeholders. I think it is easiest to explain the calculations using this hypothetical example. Let's say we begin with a batch of fuel with 10 megajoules of available energy. We find 2 megajoules of energy remains in the unburned char at the end of the test, and 3 megajoules went into the cooking process. 5 megajoules of energy was lost to the surroundings. 
Let's look at the first apple on the slide, the efficiency calculation specified in the WBT protocol gives full credit for the energy in the remaining char. The 2 megajoules of char energy is subtracted from the 10 megajoules of total energy. There is an assumption that the energy in the char represents unused energy that can be used later. In this example, thermal efficiency is 37.5%. Now let's look at the second apple. Efficiency can also be calculated with the char energy excluded, and this would apply only if the char is discarded or is used for some purpose other than for fuel, such as for biochar. Now let's look at the orange on the slide. We can calculate the ratio of the energy in the remaining char to the total available fuel energy. In this case, it is 20%. You may want to maximize this number if an objective of your stove program is to produce char, whether it is for fuel, biochar, carbon credits, or other purposes. But if your stove program is in an area where people actually discard the char, then you may consider this number as a loss of potential energy from the fuel. On the other hand, if your fuel is some type of waste biomass, such as waste rice hulls, the loss may not matter anyway. Let's look at the two apples on the slide again. We can compare thermal efficiencies with and without the char energy credit. However, we cannot add the numbers for the second apple in the orange. We cannot say the stove in this example is 50% efficient because the thermal efficiency is 30% and the char energy is 20%. While there is a common denominator, the 10 megajoules of available energy, the numerators cannot be added because they are different. They are useful, useful energy versus potential energy. We are planning to report efficiencies both ways, the two apples, and to report the ratio of energy and char to fuel energy, the orange. I, we, we think this will provide complete information, and please let us know what you think. Now Seth will continue with the tour of the spreadsheet, picking up with the efficiency calculations for this example with the char producing stove. Thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> so, We've gone back to that same test result sheet that I was looking that we were showing you before. Um, what I've done here is I've actually magnified what was visible on the bottom of the previous sheet that I showed you just to make it easier to see uh, what's going on. This is the section of the sheet that contains the typical fuel use and efficiency calculations that are that are included in the WBT spreadsheet on the Alliance website. Um, these calculations, like Jim just said, include the amount of energy in the char, so the stove gets credit for that energy, quote unquote credit. Um, next, the results with the char energy excluded. Um, so that was the second apple. <clears throat> um, these results apply only if the char remaining at the end of the burn cycle is discarded or is used for a different purpose, such as for biochar. So all of the orange shaded cells have been affected by excluding this char from the calculations. Now if we go back to the results section of our spreadsheet, um, these are more of the air pollutant emissions uh, that we measure and emission factors for each one. You see this section of the sheet, everything is shaded blue because it's specific to our equipment and our test facility. Some of these values, such as the carbon monoxide one you can see there, are used in the tier evaluations for the IWA um, that we showed you on the summary sheet, but many others are interesting or important to us at the EPA but are not currently included in the evaluations as outlined by the current IWA. Now this is the same section of the sheet, 
but on our spreadsheet it's slightly to the right, and it includes the same calculations but with the char energy excluded. So you can see, again highlighted in orange, which values are actually affected by excluding the char. Now I want to just remind everybody these values with the char energy excluded are not used currently in our spreadsheet to generate those IWA tier values. We use the um, emissions uh, information including the char energy um, for our summary sheet. Again, these are only um, used, uh, these are only valid if the remaining char is used for another purpose or discarded at the end of the, t of, of the cooking task. Now we've moved on to um, the sheet that contains all of our fuel analysis information. Uh, this would be on the WBT spreadsheet that um, some of you are familiar with, the uh, sheet that was formerly labeled calorific values. Um, all of that information is actually still here. I don't know if you notice at the top of the image, uh, you see we're in columns AQ and AR, so we're way off to the side. So we haven't actually deleted any of the the information that was included from the WBT spreadsheet on the Alliance website, but we've added our own information specific to our fuels. Um, all of these analyses are done by external labs who specialize in these types of analyses. Um, they're independent of the EPA, um, and they specialize in these testing. We could have done them ourselves if we had the equipment available. However, we're not specialized in these types of tests and so we don't want to introduce um, uncertainty just due to our lack of familiarity with the techniques. So each of our batches is made up of an entire log. Um, so each log comes from a different tree that have been bought at different points in time. Um, but I want to show you that the uh, fuel analysis um, for these samples are very consistent across all five batches as far as carbon content and energy content is concerned. So that tells us that, at least regionally, the composition of the fuel is very consistent um, across space and time. And down below that, um, we purchased one large batch of charcoal from a commercial supplier, and then we uh, mixed uh, many, many bags of charcoal together into one large batch um, and took three random samples from different parts of that batch and sent them out for analysis. And while we only have one carbon analysis done, you see that the energy content is also very um, consistent, so we can be sure that despite the fact that it came from several different bags um, from the same supplier, we have very similar energy content in all of our charcoal. We also have fuel analysis done on um, some of the remaining char, and this was done, again, by independent labs. And we have separated out the remaining char from wood-fueled stoves designed to produce char, so that's uh, stoves such as the Muoto that we're talking about today. And separately, we've grouped together the remaining char from wood-fueled stoves designed to consume the char, such as rocket stoves. They're designed to operate differently, so we don't want to lump the, the char analyses together. But I do want to show you that the char produced by both types of stoves um, has a higher carbon content and a lower volatile content than the commercially available char uh, charcoal that we bought. Um, the carbon content of the commercially available charcoal, since it's not on this sheet, was right around 81%. And you can see here we are near or above 90% in all of our samples. Um, we also, on this fuel information sheet, have analysis for liquid fuels, like kerosene and denatured alcohol that we use in parts of our testing, and the remaining char from charcoal-fueled stoves. Um, but it's uh, not shown in this presentation. Now this is our raw data sheet, um, and this particular data is from the third test that we did, so it's one of the ones that is 
being included in the overall summary data. Um, you'll see the column headings include identifiers to help us um, indicate to ourselves mostly whether the measurements are made in our primary dilution duct or our secondary dilution duct, so that's 6 and 10 inch ducts. Um, and we also have in the headings what the actual measurement is and the units that they're made in. Now the graph here is showing some of the real-time data um, for the, in particular, the airborne pollutant measurements that are made during this test. Um, the blue line is the pot temperature. So you can see here very clearly that we had three test phases, cold start, hot start, and simmer. The green line is carbon dioxide um, production, and that's an indicate one of our indications of fuel burning rate. So the higher the carbon dioxide, usually the more fuel is being burned. We also have carbon monoxide in red. Yellow, the bold one, is total hydrocarbons, and the slightly thinner one is methane, which is a portion of the total hydrocarbons. We measure oxides of nitrogen, so NOx, which is a different indication of the the temperature of the combustion because it takes higher temperature combustion to produce NOx. And then when we put all, the f all of the measurements together, we get uh, a picture of how all of the emissions kind of fit together in each test phase. On this sheet is also, if we scroll down below that graph, columns of raw, which is unmodified data. And that helps us keep a record of the raw data in the same place, in the same uh, worksheet uh, file as the process data, um, and that facilitates manual calculations when we go back to do data quality checks. And here um, is the particle data that I, I mentioned earlier for the, the near real-time, um, sorry, somebody just sent me a chat. I got distracted for a second. Uh, the real near time, the near real-time data for the particle measuring um, instrument. And you can see here, um, we start the raw data in this spreadsheet um, before the test actually starts. You can see there are no particles. And then during the ignition sequence, we have a burst of particles. And that dies down as the primary fuel begins to burn. And then the particle counts go back up. Thanks, Seth. So in summary, we discussed test methods and suggested a procedure for testing batch fueled stoves. We presented a spreadsheet for sharing data. And one reminder, again, is that the spreadsheet is not intended for use by other testing labs. We are very interested in your further comments on the methods, spreadsheet, and data sharing. At EPA, we have learned so much about stoves and stove testing from many of you so we thank you for sharing your information, knowledge, and ideas with us. The EPA spreadsheet will be posted for your review and comments. We will collect comments for three weeks. After that, we will post responses to comments. And the discussion on methods, protocols, calculations, and spreadsheets will continue after that. Our goal is to complete the current round of stove testing by the end of this year, and then we will publish results in peer-reviewed journal articles. My contact information is here. And um, next, I'm going to turn this over to Rainey and John for questions that we uh, received from people who registered. I'm sorry. Let's make sure we start on the first question. So these are questions that have been uh, submitted ahead of time. When we sent out the registration form, um, we gave all of you the opportunity to ask some questions. So we've put them here. Um, and I also see a few questions have come in through the q and A's section, so we will, um, we will uh, we'll try to get to those as well. Um, so this first question that was submitted is that a major advantage to char-making stoves 
is requiring much less time for fire tending. Present testing allows continuous second-by-second -second adjustment of fuels, which does not simulate the real world. What are plans to add test results, such as percent time away from the stove, that address this issue? Okay, so fire tending is an important usability issue. And um, in the, the, the uh, most recent publication that, um, that we, that we uh, that we that was in the, a journal article, um, and, and by the way, you can access the, the journal article for uh, for free by um, going to the link that's that's in the presentation here. So, um, so we we've in the past we've made observations on usability, and um, and there has been discussion recently in uh, some of the working groups that I've been involved with about. Um, trying to quantify usability in a better way. So uh, maybe we could quantify fire tending. Um, that, that seems like that would be a good idea. And there are other usability issues, too, besides fire tending. Uh, fuel preparation is an important one. So, um, so these, like, like, for example, this, this um, T-LUD type of stove that, that we're testing now, um, if, if you want to, when we do our tests, we want the the, um, the, bur the burning time to be a you know a certain length of time to accomplish the cooking task. So um, we cut the, the fuel sticks to a certain length to to uh, get that burn time. And um, so so if the, if users want to do the same thing, if they want to to manage their cooking time, they need to cook the cut the sticks to a certain length length if they want to stack the sticks vertically. So, um, so that's you know that's a, a fuel preparation issue, um, but um, back to the fire tending issue that is that is important you know it, and that's true not just for uh, you know the char making stoves have an advantage that um, that they can uh, burn unattended for a long period of time and that that is that's a great thing um, and other stoves other batch fueled stoves also have that advantage. That's one of the great advantage of charcoal fueled stoves is that you, you can light the charcoal and leave it, and um, it, it, it's um, you know that's I, I like to cook on charcoal for that reason too. Um, it's it's a very convenient fuel to use. Um, other usability issues are uh, another one is controllability, the ability to um, to control the power output of the stove. Um, you know a gas uh, a gas fueled or electric stove is is so easy to use because you can just turn a dial to get a, almost exactly the the power cooking power that you want and and you can get that power almost instantly and um, some stoves are better at than others at, at doing that so um, it seems that it would be a good idea to quantify the controllability of a stove and um, <clears throat> some other researchers have suggested another usability um, issue is, is the st stability of the of the um, of the of the stove. Um, in, in here, I'm talking about the stability of the uh, of the combustion. Um, there there are some of the stoves that we've um, we've tested <clears throat> have have very good performance and low emissions when they're operating at certain conditions. But it's very easy to perturb those conditions so they don't perform as well. And um, so that's another usability issue. Safety might be considered uh, as a usability issue as well. Um, so, so all of these, uh, all of these are important, and um, and I, I think you know that there will be further discussion on uh, on usability issues. Thanks, Jim. We also had a question coming in relating to the issue of the the four methods. For um, for measuring uh, the remaining char and ash, um, the the recommendation was to do a poll of who does which methods. I think that's something that could be done in a lot of the follow up activities to this webinar, similar to what was done for the charcoal protocol, where uh, a a survey was developed and then that the results of that survey was used to guide the updates to the protocol. Um, and then I will hand the Mike, over to John for the, for the next question. Thank you, Rainey. 
So the next question is, some stoves might be either too small or too large to perform well with the standard, often uh, five kilograms of water test requirement, but they might do exceedingly well with some other non-standard task. Will future protocols allow a manufacturer's recommended non-standard test? Okay, this is a good question. Um, the water boiling test suggests a, a default volume of water of five, you know, a volume of five liters of water. And um, many of the stoves that we test um, are tested with five liters of water because that's an appropriate volume to use. Um, but we test many stoves that will not boil five liters of water with the lid off of the pot. So in those cases, we, uh, we use a smaller pot. And I think that in general, <clears throat> it's, it's best practice to use the size of pot that the stove was designed for. So we, we test stoves with, we test small stoves that have lower power with two liters of water, and we are testing large institutional stoves with 60 liters of water or 100 liters of water. So the, the WPT actually does not require five, five kilograms or five liters of water. And, um, and I think generally that it, it's, it's best to use the, the uh, appropriate volume and the appropriate pot for the stove that's tested. All right, great, Jim. Uh, this next question, um, I think, is to Seth. And when you were going over the gas measurements, when you had all the data uh, below the uh, chart, the question is, are those gas measurements normalized by dilution, or are they raw measurements? Right. Uh, thanks. The, uh, in that particular sheet, the data as it's listed is not corrected for dilution because it's the raw data. But when we do our emissions calculations, we do incorporate the dilution ratio um, into the emissions calculations so that it is corrected, normalized for the uh, amount of dilution error that we have. And that's at each level of dilution that we have. Um, Jim showed that schematic where we have two dilution tunnels, and we actually have a third dilution system on top of that because some of the particle instruments we use um, get overwhelmed so easily. Um, and so the dilution is corrected at each one of those levels to get back to um, the emissions as they were coming out of the stove using the total capture method. Thanks, Seth. And I just, we just want to be clear that uh, all of the, the measurements that are in the spreadsheet for gas concentrations are concentrations that are measured in the dilution tunnels. So this, this, those concentrations are, are measured with the dilution air that's in the tunnel. So it is, it is um, you know, it is uh, emissions that are diluted with air in the dilution tunnel, and that's what the concentrations are, right? So yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so when the actual total emissions um, are calculated, then we do correct for that. But, yeah, that's a good point, Jim. If anybody's looking at the raw data when we put out the spreadsheet, uh, what you're seeing is not the concentration that's coming out of the top of, of this stove. Right, like right above the pot. It's it's what we're measuring in our dilution systems. Yeah, and we we calculate the emissions by measuring the velocity of the airflow through the dilution tunnel, and use the concentration of the pollutants that um, are measured in the dilution tunnel. And I hope that clarifies it for everyone. Yeah, if there are follow-up questions on any of these comments, oh, here one come came in from Crispin, the emissions above the stove are diluted by excess air, which varies. Um, Jim and Seth, do you have any additional comments, or should we move to the next question? Um, yeah, the, so, so there is, um, the stove uses, stoves use excess air for the combustion, and then there's a volume, the emissions are collected in a, um, in an emissions collection hood, uh, so there is a large volume of, of dilution air that is taken in into the hood, um, and then so so those concentrations we're measuring are not. It's not like we're doing stack testing. It's not like we are doing um, measuring emissions directly from a stack. 
uh, or from a chimney from a stove. We are measuring emissions in, in diluted air because um, those emission those those concentration levels are are closer to what um, the concentration levels that people would actually be exposed to right. because uh, the, the you know the, the concentrations that people would actually be breathing in the air um, in in a room. Um, okay, is there any, is that okay? That sounds great. Thanks for the additional comments. The next question, um, it, or comment and question, is that it would help everyone, it, this is a recommendation, if uh, Jim and similar expert testers testers could make general observations to stove builders on how to get better stoves and stove test results. And then okay. the follow-up is, how can testing results give suggestions to the stove designers? Okay, thanks. So at EPA, we do not design or develop stoves, and our role <clears throat> is to be an independent third-party tester. And we want to avoid even the perception of any potential bias towards any particular technology. So there are many alliance partners, and there's there are many and there's some people that are in the audience today that know much more than we do about developing and designing and building uh, building stoves. But um, nevertheless, you know, we hope that our test results and the observations that we make are helpful to stove designers. And, um, and some stove makers have told us that our work has been helpful to them. And, um, and you know, we, we want to, to make the work that we do as help, uh, to, we want it to be as helpful as it can be uh, to people that, who are, who are uh, developing, building, and improving cook stoves. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar today, to you know, to try to do a better job at that. Thank you, Jim. And I think um, I also want to let people know that uh, Aprovecho uh, Research Center has um, published Design Principles for Clean Cook Stoves uh, that was funded by the Shell Foundation and published by uh, the PCIA. And uh, that was done um, in an effort to uh, share these design principles that one might use to um, increase the uh, effectiveness of your cook stove. And, um, but this, this recommendation and question is actually, um, you know, I think it, it might be time to sort of update that work and, uh, and bring in other authors as well um, because it's uh, very helpful uh, for those people who aren't completely plugged in um, to have a reference book to work off of. Um, so the next question is um, that there are some plans to standardize fuel for testing. And uh, so the question with, with that is how useful or practical is this? Okay. Uh, so this is another topic that has come up in discussions and most recently in working groups at the Clean Cooking Forum in Cambodia. And um, in general, I think, and, and others, I think, agree that it's best to test in the lab with, with a similar fuel that's used in the field, if that's possible. Um, but if we want to compare results between labs, then we need standardized fuels. And um, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge because it's some of the, especially with biomass fuels, um, it, there's sometimes difficulties in shipping fuels between countries, and uh, it's something that, that will uh, will be discussed more, I'm sure. Okay, Jim, thank you. Um, another question was just sent in, um, and it requests, can you report always, always report uh, results with and without skirts? And so a question to you then, Jim and Seth, is what do you do with pot, uh, stoves that come with uh, pot skirts? Okay. So in the past, um, we've tested stoves with skirts if they were available for the stove. Um, you know, we know that, that, that skirts tend to, tend to improve the energy efficiency of the stove. And um, if, if you're looking at emissions in terms of, uh, of the mass of pollutant per energy 
delivered to the cooking pot, they can help out with those um, emission levels as well. And um, in the past, we've you know we, we've had the policy that if the skirt was available or if the the stove was designed with a skirt, that we use it for testing. Um, so we think it's a good idea for people to use them in the field, uh, but we know that people don't always use them. Uh, we know some, you know, some some users like them and some users don't. So, um, so I, I think you know we'll t we'll continue to test those with skirts if they're available. But I think there is also value in testing the stoves without the skirts to see how they perform. Um. And in particular, one of the ways that um, we are trying to make our laboratory testing more similar to field testing is that when a field study is done, if it's reported to us that nobody's using the pot skirt on a particular stove, um, then, we all, then we always do a test also where we don't use the skirt so that we're not um, sort of artificially improving the efficiency compared to how it will be used in the field. Thanks, uh, Jim and Seth. And then the next question is pretty general. Um, how best can a stove tester perfect their work? Um, well, I think there's probably lots of ways, but I think one of the best ways would be to, uh, to connect with the growing network of the regional testing and knowledge centers. I think that's a great recommendation. and. At least with the online connection, that's the, the link that is, was posted in the presentation. It's, it's, it's also now in the chat window, and that's the way to stay up to date on discussions and um, upcoming events uh, online and in person, um, and then ask questions to each other as well, and documents are often shared there. Okay, the next question um, is um, refers to uh, how how what ideas do you have to deal with the limitation that a stove might not have enough batch size in one filling to complete boiling uh, plus a forty five minute simmer um, in general, if you could answer that question, and then also what do you do if the stove is designed to have a spare fuel container to continue cooking okay in, in general. I think it's best to try to test in the lab in a similar way that the stove is actually used in the field. And, um, and I think that's easier for me to say that than, than it is to do that in some cases. But, um, you know, I, I think we, we try to, to, to um, be consistent with the water boiling test protocol to the extent that it's practical. But some of the stoves that we test um, just, you know, do not perform in a way that can be consistent with the with the water boiling test protocol. So, in those cases, I think you know we have to we, we have to do modifications to the protocol, just like we're proposing this modification for the uh, batch fueled stoves now. So, I, I think you know if a if a stove has a spare fuel container, I think. I think it would be good to to look at how that's actually used in the field and to try to replicate that in the lab uh, as as best as possible. All right, we're going to go to the next question, which was submitted prior to the webinar. Um, char using stoves generally use char made badly, if not illegally. What are the Global Alliance plans? for showing data for both the best and worst use of different biomass feedstocks in the production of char and how that should influence stated efficiencies of char using stoves. So that's a, a pretty broad question. I think it's um, related to the webinar, but a, a very big and separate topic on its own, evaluating the production of fuels the efficiency, the environmental impact, the sustainability, the resource availability, that is something that we are um, looking to focus on. And of course, in terms of research studies or methods or tools that are developed with Global Alliance support, those are made uh, publicly available. 
Um, so this is an area of interest, and uh, certainly that, that type of information we would like to um, get a better handle on, on what the situation is and also report that as much as we can, um, given that uh, you know, a lot of these things are going to vary from region to region and producer to producer. Uh, but this is something that is of interest and a goal. And then the other question um, sounds like it's directed to the Global Alliance as well. There are countries giving zero credit for char production in their present national stove testing protocols, viewing as a char as a problem, not a benefit. Will this continue or be changed in those countries receiving Global Alliance funding? Um, in general, the, the use of, of biomass and charcoal is quite different in different countries. And so um, from our perspective at the Global Alliance, we really want to respect and respect the um, experts who are familiar with the use of stoves in their country to establish testing, um, testing protocols that make sense for their country. I think that Jim's proposal to to kind of do the calculation in multiple ways, whether uh, considering if the charcoal might be reused for fuel or if it would be discarded. That way, both information is available. Um, that's one proposal that could address this issue. Um, but that, that's our general approach for um, national governments deciding policies, that at the international level, we're looking to harmonize and share as much as possible and then with national standards, um, that each country has their priorities and their their particular context that to the international standards might be adapted or um, the international standards should be flexible to accommodate the different situations. Looks like we have another question that came in. Um, an early slide showed tier one and two results. Uh, the question is, can you review the level setting procedures? Uh, Jim and Seth, do you guys want to discuss this? Um, sure. Yeah, let's, um, should we, I'm, I'm thinking, should we put that slide back up? Yeah, I'm looking for that now. Maybe you start testing, or start talking, and then I will look for that slide. Okay. I, um, <laughs> we included a link to the um, IWA document, and um, you you can find the the uh, levels that were recommended in the IWA for setting the the um, different tier levels for efficiency, emissions, indoor emissions, and safety. And um, so the way it works, like like with efficiency, there is a high power thermal efficiency. And there are, are four tier levels. It's 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 actually actually zero and one two three four five and one two three and four. So there's a high power thermal efficiency number, and there's a low power specific energy consumption. And um, you can look in the IWA document and see what those levels are. So then, um, if we're looking at efficiency and fuel use here, uh, for this this stove scored a two on high power thermal efficiency and a one on low power specific energy consumption. And the, uh, the lower value is used for the, um, for the overall tier rating. And um, that is consistent with the other, with the other uh, indicators. Um, and um, John or Rainey, do you want to add anything to that? I think that covers it well. I was trying to pull up a slide to to show the tier system, but I think that's going to wind up taking too much time and being too complicated. Um, I, I do know that there are a few different views about how the, the individual metrics within one indicator are combined. Um, I think that is something that you know is we could reevaluate as the standards discussions continue, but based on how things are. Um, were presented at the International Workshop Agreement. Um, the, the overall tier levels are determined by the minimum tier value of the, 
of the individual metrics. It looks like it's, it's pretty quiet with the questions coming in, and we've covered the ones that were submitted um, ahead of the webinar. I think that was uh, the timing worked out quite well. Jim and Seth, thank you so much for going through all of this information. I think um, seeing the spreadsheet and how clearly you guys walked through it was, was very useful. And then also the, the points for discussion, I think, will lead to a lot of potential interesting discussions following up. We could think about putting together some kind of survey, as was recommended, and also as was done for the charcoal protocol. So I think if you are interested in continuing on these discussions related to how uh, batch-fueled stoves are tested, how to deal with stoves that may produce char, um, please definitely get in touch with us, and then we can make sure to uh, continue with the conversation. And John, do you have any? Yeah, and I also wanted just to remind folks that Jim and Seth had uh, made a request that people evaluate the spreadsheet and get back to them with their, uh, with their comments. Um, uh, I also want to thank uh, Jim and Seth for all the work uh, that they've been doing and this excellent presentation describing uh, their work. Uh, Jim and Seth, any final thoughts? No, thank you to everyone for, uh, for joining us today, and thanks for the good questions and comments, and um, we hope to, uh, hope to be uh, getting more feedback. And thank you, John and Rainey. All right, thank you, everyone, and we will see you. Oh, actually, one comment before we sign off. Um, we would like to continue um, have a bit of a webinar series focused on testing issues, particularly around data analysis and management. We are looking to schedule one for mid-November um, that will focus on some of the regional testing labs, uh, R2KCs, on what they are doing <clears throat> to um, – to organize and help with their data management and, and developing data systems for ensuring um, that we can do the appropriate quality checks, that we can have transparency for the data. Um, so look forward to that, to more information about that webinar coming up soon. Thank you, everyone.